Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. I have the pleasure today of introducing Dr. Vanessa Gildenstern. Um, Vanessa has been a member in pediatric dermatology in our division since 2012, and she comes from Texas. We won't hold it against you that you're a Cowboys fan here. That's okay. Um, in Texas, she went to UT Southwestern Medical School before completing her pediatric residency um, here, actually, at uh, PCH, and that's where I met Vanessa. And then she did our pediatric dermatology fellowship here and has been here ever since. Um, she's our pediatric dermatology rotation director for the pediatrics rotation. She does an excellent job with our pediatric residents, and she holds several academic appointments, um, including that at University of Arizona, Creighton, and Mayo Clinic. Uh, and she is going to do her second grand rounds in 12 months, I think, and talk about infantile hemangiomas, where did the OR cases go, with a specific emphasis on um, medical therapy and the role of surgery. So thank you, Vanessa. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate your making the time to be here this morning. Um, so this morning I'm going to invite you to join me as we endeavor to solve a mystery. The mystery of the missing hemangiomas, where did the OR cases go? So in order to um, solve this mystery, we have to meet three main objectives, which is to review what hemangiomas are and how they behave, how they're treated with propranolol, and to investigate whether propranolol might be playing a role in these missing OR cases. I have no conflicts of interest. I will be discussing the use of propranolol in depth for the treatment of hemangiomas, and as a generic, this would be considered an off-label use. And um, this is the second Tuesday of the month, so it's a surgical grand rounds, um, and those surgeons in the room out there might recognize that I typically don't hang out in the OR. I am not a surgeon. So if you ever see me in the OR, please direct me to where I need to go. That means I'm lost. <laughs> So I feel a little bit like that among surgeons. Um, but really the point of this slide is also to highlight something else, which is that there are lots and lots of mimickers of hemangiomas. And these mimickers do not behave the same as hemangiomas, nor are they treated the same. So it's really, really important to not, fool, uh, not, um, not be fooled by them. Uh -huh. So before you think, well, hemangiomas are pretty classic. I think it's kind of hard to confuse that for something else. I'd invite you to think again. So this is a study out of the most prominent vascular anomaly center in the country at Boston Children's. And what they did was they looked at their outside referrals of patients who are already undergoing therapy with propranolol. Uh, it was a fairly small series, only 65 patients. But what they found is fully one quarter had been misdiagnosed with hemangiomas and were undergoing therapy with propranolol. So misdiagnosis and mismanagement definitely happens, and we don't want that to happen here. So here are public enemies numbers one through five. Um, this is not a comprehensive list, but these are some of the most common mimickers of hemangiomas. So we'll start first with congenital hemangiomas. So congenital hemangiomas are tumors that are fully formed at birth. I mean, right minute one, fresh out of the womb. So often when we meet families with uh, infants who have really classic infantile hemangiomas and we ask them, when did you first notice this lesion? Most times they're going to say at birth. But then you have to delve deeper and then they'll clarify things and say, well, actually it started off as this tiny little pink spot or it looked like a scratch and then two or three weeks later it started to grow. That is distinct from a congenital hemangioma, which is fully formed at birth. Um, time helps to differentiate what type of congenital hemangioma this might be, either rapidly involuting, partially involuting, or non-involuting. Now in the case that for some reason you don't have the luxury of time to help you differentiate and you have to intervene and you end up getting tissue, you'll find that these tumors stay negative for the glucose transporter isoform 1, or GLUT1. And as we continue to go through the mimickers, you'll find that this is a very useful stain to help parse out the posers. So here's a patient of mine. He and his parents had driven about two or three hours to see me one morning. And I first asked them how the drive went with a six-day-old neonate. <laughs> and then my very next question was, when did you notice this mass? 
and the parents were adamant that it had been present immediately at birth. They pulled out their cell phones and showed me pictures of him under the hospital warmer with his little hospital issue cap on, and sure enough, that mass was there. So you'll notice in this uh, first picture, this little, oh, that's a small pointer, but this little rim of pallor right around that pink staining, that's pretty characteristic of congenital hemangiomas, but it is by no means a specific marker. So I followed him really closely for a while, at one point every two weeks, until over time it became very evident that his was improving quite quickly. So there at seven weeks of age, he already has significant lightening, flattening, and softening. And by five months of age, there's already so much involution that there's um, overlying redundant skin. So if you had to guess which of the three types of congenital hemangiomas this is, what would you say? Rapidly involuting, partially involuting, or non-involuting? Yes, I heard somebody. You can be confident, say it louder. <laughs> so yeah, rapidly involuting. Here's another patient of mine, very similar story. I met him at about three weeks of age and parents related that he'd had this you know, really deeply pink vascular mass on his scalp immediately at birth. I followed him closely and his too became much lighter, flatter, and softer quite quickly. So another example of a rapidly involuting congenital hemangioma. Now we'll consider pyogenic granulomas. And this is something we see quite a lot in dermatology. I don't know if the surgeons are getting these in, in your clinic or not. You do, okay. Uh -huh. So these are reactive vascular neoplasms. They may occur in areas of trauma like a bug bite or a scratch, or they may arise spontaneously. They're most commonly on the head and neck, and only a minority occur in infancy, but nearly half do occur in young children. These present as these really bright red, often pedunculated papules, um, they erode very easily, they bleed very easily. So often there's a lot of hemorrhagic crusting associated with these. And because they seem to bleed at the snap of a finger, patients often will wear band-aids over top. And this is something that we in dermatology dub the band-aid sign. So if you're seeing a young child for a chief complaint of bleeding bump, and you walk in and there's a band-aid somewhere on the head and neck, you'd really be well served to think of a PG. Now, PGs can mimic bad things like melanoma. So when we shave these off and cauterize the base, we always send that tissue for pathology. And like congenital hemangiomas, PGs are also GLUT1 negative. Here is a patient of mine with a rather large PG. You'll see that it's this bright cherry red vascular papule. Um, I know it's not entirely clear on that side view, but it is pedunculated, and there's a fair amount of hemorrhagic cresting along the perimeter. Now, I had removed it for purposes of doing the exam and taking this photo, but you see this really nice uh, geometrically shaped pink irritant dermatitis there, corresponding to the adhesive from her Band-Aid. So she had indeed presented with a positive Band-Aid sign. Now we'll consider these two tumors in tandem, the Kaposiform hemangioendotheliomas, or KHEs for short, and the tufted angiomas. So these are really a lot more difficult to coach you on because they're really unpredictable. So they may be congenital or not. They might arise later in infancy. Um, they can present differently. So they can be really firm, indurated maroon masses or lighter pink to violaceous patches, plaques, or nodules. Um, they may grow very slowly or grow very quickly. They may spontaneously regress. They could become dormant and then reactivate. Um, and in the worst case, it can start to trap platelets and lead to a potentially life-threatening coagulopathy called Kassebach merit phenomenon. So because these often misbehave, at some point, most of these do end up getting biopsied. And just like the other mimickers, this is GLUT1 negative. So here on the right, you see a picture of a KHE with a really firm, indurated, bright pink mass. You would definitely be thinking about the possibility of platelet trapping in that situation. And then on the right, you see a picture of a tufted angioma with a nice light pink vascular staining and a rim of pallor, not unlike what we saw with congenital hemangiomas. Now we'll veer away from vascular tumors unto a class of mimickers unto itself, vascular malformations. 
So these are structural anomalies of the vessels due to inborn errors of vasculogenesis. So anomalies of the vessels, not tumors. Um, so they uh, can involve any of the, of the vessels, capillary, venous, lymphatic, or arterial. And we know that they are under the influence of hormones. So often we see periods of more rapid growth concurrent with growth spurts in the child, certainly during adolescence um, and during pregnancy if you happen to have an adult patient. They can grow more acutely in the case of local trauma directly to the lesion or in the setting of infection. So a scenario we encounter quite a lot in the hospital would be that of a child with a congenital mass that had been growing proportionally with the kiddo and then seemingly overnight becomes um, much larger, indurated, painful in the setting of fever. That would be much more consistent with a kid that has a vascular malformation, probably a lymphatic one, versus a tumor. So here are some examples of some vascular malformations. So in the top left, you have a pretty classic port wine stain or capillary malformation. On the top right is a patient of mine with a venous malformation with that blue subcutaneous mass and surrounding venous varicosities. And if you were able to palpate that mass, you would also appreciate phleboliths, little clots within the veins. On the bottom left is a microcystic lymphatic malformation and on the bottom right, an arteriovenous malformation. So like I alluded to before, the list of mimickers that I gave you is, is not all encompassing. There are lots of other more esoteric vascular tumors and there's different combinations of vascular malformations and some with syndromic associations and known genetic mutations that are causative of those. So if you want to know more about this, then I invite you to visit the website for the International Society for the Study of Vascular Anomalies, or ISVA for short. So this group uh, periodically updates the formal classification of tumors and malformations. So if you want the most up-to-date information, you would go here. So now imagine with me, if you will, a scenario, which may or may not be a page out of your book. It certainly is out of mine. So let's say that it's 9.30 at night. And for all intents and purposes, it feels like it's 2 a.m. because you're tired, you're like really tired. So you shelve everything else that you have left to do and you're just gonna get to bed because you know that the next day you have a long day of work and you really are hoping to wake up feeling refreshed and ready for the day. And you're proud of yourself because you get to bed. But then you didn't count on your kiddo waking you up at 3.30 with a nightmare. And you immediately, immediately regret your decision to having let her watch Monsters, Inc. You thought it was Pixar, no big deal. But it's not past her. She, she noticed that it's all about monsters. So she wakes up. And you're a pro at this at this point. You get her back to bed. She's asleep within 15 minutes. But now you are wide awake. So two hours later, you don't even turn off your alarm because you didn't have to. You never fell back to sleep. So now you're feeling even more tired now than you did the night before. And you're heading off to work. And you just hope that you'll have time to go downstairs and grab a cup of coffee. You're sitting watching your tracking board and you think, wow, my first patient's gonna be a no-show. Maybe I can go down there real quick. And just as you're gonna get up, that little outpatient dashboard updates to front desk lobby. So at this point, they're already like 20 minutes past their appointment. They haven't even made it to your clinic yet. But you think, I better sit back and see what's going on. So sure enough, mom comes up with baby. She's really flustered. She's been waiting two months for this appointment. She explains that she's late because she was waiting for a babysitter because this kid's older sibling woke up early in the morning sick. And you're like, gosh, that sounds kind of familiar. This lady's got, you know, she's had a worse day than I have so far. So you look at the chief complaint and it's a two and a half month old female with birthmark. There's no outside records. So you're hoping it's something quick. And then you walk in and you see that. And you immediately know that is not gonna happen. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so who is this culprit that is blocking your way out the door to get your cup of coffee? It's a hemangioma. And it's one that you're likely to see over and over and over again because it is the most common benign tumor of infancy, occurring in about 5% of infants. These represent unrepressed endothelial cell proliferation. And there's two theories that these cells may arise from either intrinsic endothelial progenitor cells 
or from angioblast of placental origin. And then they grow under the influence of vasculogenic or angiogenic factors in areas that are deemed favorable for their growth, hypoxic areas or areas with developmental field defects. These, unlike the other mimickers we reviewed before, are GLUT1 positive. And most often they become apparent by about two to three weeks of life. Then they follow this very characteristic uh, arch of proliferation, plateau, and involution. And the proliferation phase occurs quite quickly with 80% of growth done by three months of age and with that peak velocity of growth between one to two months of age. Now there are exceptions to that rule. Deep hemangiomas can proliferate for longer periods of time, nine months or even longer, and segmental hemangiomas in particular have been reported to have proliferation phases anywhere between 10 to 44 months. After that point, they enter a, a period of relative inactivity called the plateau phase, and then involution sets in, uh, usually around six to 12 months of age, with uh, the majority of involution done by between four to five years of age. So there are several possible risk factors for hemangiomas. Um, the riskiest scenario would be that of a Caucasian female born preterm and low birth weight as part of a multiple gestation to a mother of advanced maternal age. And if her mother also happened to have either preeclampsia or placenta previa, her risk would be even higher. So we tend to think of hemangiomas in two ways. So one is by morphologic subtype, and the other is by distribution. So these are the three most common morphologic subtypes of hemangiomas, superficial, deep, and mixed. So your superficial hemangioma is your classic strawberry hemangioma, a bright red vascular plaque. A deep hemangioma will present as either a skin-colored or light blue subcutaneous mass, and a mixed hemangioma is some combination of the two. Now, Using capillary to denote superficial and cavernous to denote deep is considered really outdated. Please do not do this. It will only lead to confusion. Now, thinking about hemangiomas in terms of distribution, these are the four categories. Focal hemangiomas account for the vast majority, about 68%. So these are localized, well-defined hemangiomas. If you have more than one, that's considered multifocal. If the hemangioma seems to involve a segment of the, of the body, um, perhaps looking somewhat linear or block-like, that would be a segmental hemangioma. And then those that don't fit into those three categories well get lumped into the indeterminate bucket. And about 16% of hemangiomas are indeed indeterminate. Now a special note on multifocal hemangiomas. So if a patient has five or more cutaneous hemangiomas, we would really want to consider the possibility of a condition called infantile hemangiomatosis, wherein these patients have hepatic hemangiomas. If you could, so certainly any patient with that scenario, you'd want to get a limited abdominal ultrasound of the liver. If you confirm liver hemangiomas, then you would need to know to take it one step further and screen for, of all things, actually hypothyroidism. So these tumors upregulate the activity of an enzyme that inactivates thyroid hormone. So here are, uh, here's a schematic of some segmental hemangioma distributions. So these are um, basically developmental segments arising from the neuroectoderm. And at least on the face, these are pretty well characterized. And so if you see this type of distribution, you should really be thinking about whether there might be anomalies in other organ systems, specifically the structural brain, the vasculature of the brain and the neck, uh, the eye, the heart, and any ventral um, midline defects. So if those are found, that would be consistent with something called face syndrome. Now, if you have a segmental hemangioma of the lower body and you find associated urogenital anomalies or spinal dysraphism, that would be considered lumbar or pelvis syndrome. So think about other organ systems when you see segmental hemangiomas. So now you have this lesion and you feel really confident that it belongs in the infantile hemangioma bucket. It's not a different kind of tumor. It's not a malformation. Now you have to decide. Is this something that you can observe or is this something that needs to be treated? 
So based on U.S. data, about one quarter to one third of hemangiomas do eventually require treatment. So what I was going to say is that um, it's not always super obvious which ones you have to treat or not. So there's lots of different indications for treatment. They're listed here and we'll go through each one. So the first is super obvious. If the hemangioma is life-threatening, you want to intervene. So what are the different scenarios where that might happen? Well, for one, bleeding. This is super rare. I personally have never seen it, but it could theoretically happen in the case of a really deeply ulcerated hemangioma, particularly over a highly vascular site like the scalp. What we see much more commonly is airway involvement and hepatic involvement. So airway hemangiomas are gonna present with biphasic stridor, plus or minus a barky cough, plus or minus a hoarse cry. And most of these are going to be diagnosed by about three and a half months of age which makes sense, right? Because 80% of the growth is done by three months of age. Kids should be developing their symptoms by that point. Now with any luck, and about 50% of the time this is the case, there will be some kind of cutaneous hemangioma outwardly that will clue you in to the possibility of an airway hemangioma. Typically these are along the beard distribution, the anterior neck, and the mucosa of the mouth or the pharynx. Uh, now, particularly if you see a beer distribution hemangioma, and certainly if it's bilateral, about half of those kids will have airway hemangiomas. So be particularly suspicious of those. Now, what about hepatic involvement? How could that be life-threatening? Well, there's different mechanisms. So the first is that it could predispose to congestive heart failure, either through macro macrovascular shunting or through impaired ven venous return. We all know that there's only so much room in the belly of a small baby, and so if there's significant rapid growth, that could lead to compartment syndrome. If there's compression of the renal vein, that could lead to renal failure. And we just reviewed how uh, hepatic hemangiomas can mediate hypothyroidism and how you should be on the lookout for hepatic hemangiomas if a baby has five or more cutaneous hemangiomas. So if we only chose to treat hemangiomas that were life-threatening, that would be a pretty low bar to set. So we know that hemangiomas need not threaten life to threaten function, particularly feeding, hearing, and vision, all super important things for a neonate. So oral and airway hemangiomas can impair feeding. Uh, hemangiomas in and around the ear can grow such that they occlude the ear canal and then impact hearing. And what about vision? What about a baby like her with this really exophytic mass placed squarely over her upper eyelid? What's the worst that could happen in that situation? Well, unfortunately, a lot of things. Arguably, the worst would be amblyopia, and about half to just over half of patients with periocular hemangiomas who are not treated will develop amblyopia. So we have to act pretty fast for these. Uh, particularly in cases of hemangiomas that are large and located over the medial upper eyelid. And I alluded to this before, um, but let's say that you have a segmental hemangioma. It's not threatening life, it's behaving itself, it's um, not impacting function in any way. The hemangioma itself may not need any intervention, but you would have to know to screen for other things that may. So you might uncover a spinal dysraphism or something else that really does need surgical attention. And you won't know if, if you don't look. This is a huge one, so disfigurement. Um, so let's say that that nasal tip hemangioma never impacted breathing or the oral hemangioma never impacted feeding. Well, what about the disfigurement it could leave behind if left untreated? Now you've got this patient who may have a lifetime of suffering from anxiety, depression, PTSD from the bullying they endured when they were kiddos. And we as physicians have the power to really change a person's life trajectory if we intervene on time. I can't tell you how often we in dermatology meet hemangioma babies where we're really just using medical therapy to mitigate the damage, but we're well past the point of preventing it. So this is really important. You know, remember this next time you see a hemangioma patient. We know that certain hemangiomas are more at risk for causing disfigurement than others. 
Certainly segmental ones, they have that prolonged growth phase, even just by virtue of the expanse that they cover. Um, those over cartilaginous sites, like the nasal tip and the ears, those involving the lip, especially if they cross the vermilion border, those of the female breast, such that there might be a setup for significant breast asymmetry in the future, any large exophytic hemangioma, and even thick superficial ones with a stepped off border. So what is a stepped off border? It's kind of like it sounds. It's a steep ledge, like you see here with the strawberry. So a hemangioma with that architecture, once it involutes, is more likely to leave some overlying redundant tissue, as opposed to one with a more gradual sloped border, like you see on the icing. So here's a real life example of my patient who has both a steep stepped off border at one pole and a more gradual sloped border at the other. Another very common reason for intervening would be ulceration. And up to 20% of hemangiomas do eventually ulcerate. We don't exactly know why they ulcerate, but the thought is that, that there is some kind of mismatch between the supply and demand of blood, oxygen, and or space. There are lots of known risk factors. This tends to occur in early infancy during that rapid proliferative phase, particularly in segmental and superficial hemangiomas. Um, this tends to occur in really highly vascular sites like the perioral area and the perineal area, and in areas that are subject to maceration and friction, so intratriginous sites. Now, once an ulceration has set in, there is a possibility for secondary complications. For sure, pain, sometimes bleeding, sometimes secondary infection, and inevitably scarring. Here is a patient of my colleague, Dr. Rusi's. Uh, you see that she's got multifocal areas of ulceration. She's got impetigo, her ear canal is obstructed. She's got significant disfigurement already, even on presentation. Definitely one that you would treat. So now you're not feeling so bad that we're back in clinic with this patient. You feel it's not, not as, as big of a deal. And you, you know now that, okay, well this is a hemangioma and it's one that I need to treat. Well, remember, she came really late, right? So now it's like 35 minutes past her appointment time. You've got two other patients waiting. Is this a situation where you would say, you know, come back in a month and we'll talk about it then? Or is this something where you really have to take care of it right now? There's a finite window of opportunity. And if you wait too late, it will close. So remember, 80% of infantile hem hemangioma growth is done by three months of age. And that rapid growth phase is between one to two months of age. So I'll sound like chicken little, but any infantile hemangioma at risk really should be evaluated by the appropriate subspecialist by one month of age, ideally. So you know that you've got a hemangioma. It's gotta be treated, you have to treat it today. Who are you gonna call? Propranolol. Um, and I'll just briefly mention that hemangiol is the branded form of propranolol. It was FDA approved for the indication of infantile hemangioma in March 2014. It's an alcohol, paraben, and sugar-free formulation of this medication. But for the purposes of this talk, we'll just be talking about propranolol. So this is a glimpse into how my mind is, kind of works weirdly sometimes. But, um, when I think about the evolution of medical therapy for hemangiomas, for some reason it makes me think of the evolution of milk preferences over time. Don't ask me why, it just does. So vincristine and interferon alpha, like dairy milk, are way out. Propranolol, like soy milk, is rarely used on occasion. Um, and propranolol, like almond milk, is now super mainstream. So this is the landmark seminal paper uh, that was published in 2008 by Latola Brez and her colleagues in Paris. So they detailed their experience treating two infants for significant hemangiomas. They were undergoing therapy with steroids and unfortunately developed cardiac complications. One developed cardiomyopathy and this patient was developing high output cardiac failure. So because of that, they were placed on propranolol and they serendipitously discovered that their hemangiomas started to melt away really significantly. So there you see the progression of this patient's hemangioma starting at nine weeks of age and then all the way through nine months of age at which point he's already graduated off propranolol. 
So this spurred a multitude, a multitude of studies looking at the safety and efficacy of propranolol such that uh, that is now well substantiated and propranolol is considered first line therapy. So for as much as we know that propranolol is safe and effective, we actually really don't know exactly how it mediates its action on hemangiomas. These are the various hypotheses. And it's an area of active research. So I poured through some of these papers <laughs> and found basically that there is some evidence that propranolol can both inhibit angiogenesis and induce apoptosis by a variety of different pathways. So suffice it to say that at least two of these hypotheses is being substantiated. Now, how well does propranolol work? The answer is really, really well. The failure rate is really low, especially in infants um, who are started on therapy early at less than two months of age. It's just 1.9%. If therapy is delayed anywhere between two to eight months of age, that failure rate goes up to about 7%. 60% will experience complete resolution within six months of treatment. And some families will report um, usually fairly subtle lightening and softening even within the first few hours to days of therapy. And propranolol actually may in some cases help even um, hemangiomas that are already in the plateau phase. Here's a patient of my colleague, Dr. Andrews. On the left here, he is at three months of age with an eye occluding periocular hemangioma. And on the right there, he is eight months later with a significant improvement after propranolol. Now for this little guy, as for any patient for which we're considering propranolol therapy, we must first assess whether they are adequate, adequate candidates for propranolol. So aside from just doing a routine history and physical, we really screen for any potential cardiac contraindications and additionally for any concern for reactive airways disease or for any reason why that child might have um, impaired glucose control. So here's the nuts and bolts of propranolol use. So the study doses and the doses that we most commonly use are one to three milligrams per kilogram per day divided into two to three times daily dosing. Now, sometimes we do modify this dosing scheme. Uh, for instance, if we have a face syndrome patient deemed at risk for stroke, or if there's a patient experiencing side effects at the typical dosing, or in the case of a patient with really progressive ulceration, in any of those situations, we would actually decrease the propranolol dose. Um, parents are coached to give this medication always after a feeding to help protect against hypoglycemia. And infants who are under six months of age are allowed to sleep no longer than six hours in a row without feeding overnight. And those over six months of age are allowed to sleep no longer than eight hours in a row without feeding overnight. We also coach our families to withhold therapy in the case of any situation that might be a setup for hypoglycemia, impaired feeding, vomiting, diarrhea, and also in the case of wheezing. The FDA sanctions the outpatient initiation of propranolol for any baby who's over five weeks of age with periodic heart rate and blood pressure monitoring for the first two hours after the initial dose. Most kids are treated up to about one year of age to minimize the risk of rebound growth upon discontinuation. So there's lots of potential side effects to propranolol. You find them listed here. A uh, Medline and Cochrane database review of all pa papers on the subject of propranolol use for hemangiomas found that one third of patients will experience a side effect, typically sleep disturbance or acrocyanosis. Only 0.8% will experience a serious adverse event defined as symptomatic hypotension, bradycardia, or hypoglycemia. So we know that propranolol can cause hypotension and bradycardia and hypoglycemia. But what about the sleep disturbance? So it turns out that propranolol blocks the 5-hydroxytryptamine receptor, that, which results in decreased melatonin production and thus impaired sleep regulation. So a special note on neurologic side effects. There is some data in adults indicating that propranolol may impair memory, psychomotor function, and mood. To so far, this has not been replicated in the pediatric population. Nevertheless, propranolol is lipophilic and can cross the blood-brain barrier. So there's a 
thought that perhaps this isn't the safest beta blocker to use. So the natural question is what about hydrophilic beta blockers? Would those be any safer or better? So this was a paper published just this year that sought to investigate that question. And so what they did is they took a mouse model and then they gave doses of propranolol and two hydrophilic beta blockers, natalol and atenolol. And they used reasonable doses meant to replicate therapeutic doses. These were not horse doses. Then they measured uh, the concentration of reactive metabolites, particularly nitric oxide and hydrogen peroxide, as a measure of central toxicity. And they looked at these specifically in the hypothalamus because that's an area where the blood-brain barrier is physiologically absent. And what they found was not very reassuring. So both of the hydrophilic beta blockers could increase the concentration of either or both reactive metabolites in the micromolar range deemed sufficient to induce central toxicity. So the jury is still out, but based on this one paper, it seems that hydrophilic beta blockers may not really be much better than propranolol. So now we'll veer away from the oral beta blockers and just um, touch on an honorable mention for timolol, which is a topical beta blocker. So its use for superficial thin hemangiomas has proven quite promising. So two randomized control trials and four cohort studies together found about a 62% mean estimate of expected clearance, particularly if it's used for greater than three months. The form used is the 0.5% gel forming ophthalmic solution and the dose studied was one drop on the hemangioma twice daily. So a couple of notes of caution here. Timolol only penetrates about one millimeter into the skin so it is not going to help for a thick hemangioma and certainly not for a deep hemangioma. Timolol as a beta blocker is much stronger than propranolol. So its use should be avoided or endeavored with great caution if you were gonna put it over an ulceration. And then lastly, this is an ophthalmic solution being applied topically. So uh, I once saw a kiddo and follow up for whom I had prescribed Timolol for a nice, small, thin hemangioma. And the parents related to me that they were putting the medicine in each eye twice a day. At which point, he's at even higher risk for hypotension and bradycardia, and we hadn't talked about that. So I immediately panicked, and I thought, maybe I forgot to change the mode of administration on my prescription, and I hadn't. It said topical, and that's what I told them. So then I said, well, wh why, why, why are you doing that? And so they said, well, the pharmacist said that we had to put it in the eye. So now I double and triple and quadruple check and say, no matter what anyone else tells you, even if it's a pharmacist, you know that this is only going on the skin and nowhere else. So, so far we've talked a lot about hemangioma mimickers, hemangiomas, medical therapy, but this is the second Thursday of the month. It's a surgical grand rounds. So why is that? Well, partly because of this. Involution does not mean resolution. So even an appropriately treated hemangioma often leaves a lot of damage in its wake. And that's where we really rely on you guys to help. Take for instance, Dr. Rusi's patient upon presentation here at about a couple months of life. Here she is one year later, having had significant improvement with propranolol, but none of us would deem this a satisfactory final result. She's got pendulous fibro fatty residua, continued distortion of her pinna, and still a lot of remaining vascular staining. So in what situations might we jump to surgery sooner than later? Well, in the case that we actually can't use a beta blocker, that there's some kind of contraindication, or in the case that a child is in that 2% that simply will not respond even when it's initiated on time. What about a really small hemangioma that's just really like persistently ulcerated even though they're on propranolol, even though you've tried wound care? If it's in an easily resectable location, that would be really reasonable. Or in the case that starting surgery early might pave the road for a smoother reconstruction later. Or in the case that there really just is no benefit to waiting to do surgery. Now let's say that surgery was not done in early infancy uh, what are some factors to consider in terms of intervention later on? So what is the age of the patient? Is that child still so young that the anesthesia risk is higher than we would like? 
in what phase is the hemangioma? Is it still really highly vascular? Is there going to be a lot of bleeding? Where is the hemangioma located? Is it over one of these sites that's really difficult to reconstruct? What's the degree of deformity? Is it major? Is it minor? Can it wait? And do we really feel that surgery will provide a favorable outcome? These are all hard questions to answer and certainly ones that you would endeavor to answer case by case. But there are some, there's a silver lining to this. You can, you know, take the glass half full approach um, and think that infantile hemangiomas can act as their own tissue expanders to allow for primary closure. Because hemangiomas are benign, total excision is not the goal. It's usually just partial resection. And lots of hemangiomas are circular or round, and this may allow for a purse string closure. So what would be the optimal time to intervene? Generally between three to four years of age. Why? Because if you wait long enough, you might not have to do anything if that involution is really significant. If you wait, the tumor is smaller, and so theoretically the surgery might be easier and result in a smaller scar. And eventually that tumor transitions from highly vascular to more adipose tissue, and so the risk for bleeding is lower. Now on the other hand, why not wait till well after four years of age? Well, there's a pragmatic answer that most kids start school at around five. And the other is that you don't want to wait until the child becomes increasingly self-conscious about their lesion. So here's a patient of my colleague, Dr. Rusi's. The top two panels show him upon presentation at about four months of age, where he's got a pretty bulbous hemangioma causing partial collapse of that right nasal ala. And then about a year later, here he is looking much, much better after propranolol therapy. So this is a case where early surgical intervention really wouldn't have been the best for him. So what about kids that are treated with propranolol and then undergo surgery? Do they have improved surgical outcomes? Well, there is precious little on this subject. In fact, this is the only paper I could find addressing that question. And it's out of the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. It's a retrospective cohort study, fairly small, just 77 patients who underwent surgery over a six-year period. So 36% of these surgical patients did undergo previous medical therapy, with 58% having used beta blockers and 42% having used steroids. And they didn't include it on their table, but basically what they reported is that 53% of their surgical patients had a, quote, great surgical result. And they defined great as parental satisfaction lack of complications, and no need to return to the OR. So what they found was no difference between the non-pretreated and the pretreated cases. And furthermore, they found no difference between those pretreated with steroids versus those pretreated with propranolol. What they did find is that the pretreated group tended to have surgery at a younger age. And the authors postulated that maybe that's because the medical therapy helped to induce involution sooner, thereby allowing for intervention sooner. So since there's not a whole lot of data on surgical outcome, maybe we could focus on something else like surgical rates. So this is a nice study published out of Cincinnati Children's just this year, also a retrospective cohort study, looking at 32 infantile hem hemangioma patients having undergone surgery over a nine-year period. And their question was, does prior therapy with propranolol result in fewer interventions versus those pretreated with steroids? And the answer was a resounding yes. So those treated with propranolol were 3.3 times less likely to require surgical intervention. Now we'll go from Cincinnati to Baltimore to Johns Hopkins. So they did a retrospective review of about 560 patients over a 10 year period. And they found that about 2% of those treated with propranolol eventually required surgical intervention, either laser um, or plastic surgical intervention. That's really similar to the numbers um, out of this meta-analysis, where less than 2% of patients were deemed non-responders to early propranolol and eventually required surgical intervention. So now we'll go across the pond to Spain, specific to, specifically to La Paz Children's Hospital in Madrid. So they did, similarly, a retrospective cohort study of their patients undergoing um, surgery for hemangiomas. But they took it a step further and subdivided their group into those that were um, seen 
before the propranolol era and those after the propranolol era. And what they found was a 90% reduction in their surgical rates. So they went from an average of 60 cases per year to just six cases per year. And even in those six cases per year, upon chart review, what became clear is that most of those kids ended up needing surgery because propranolol was not started soon enough. So La Paz Children's is also a liver transplant center. So they chose to look at that as well. So between 1995 to 2005, they had seven patients listed for liver transplant for the indication of hepatic hemangioma. Four of them, unfortunately, died while they were on the waiting list. Since the introduction of propranolol there, there have been none listed for liver transplant for hepatic hemangioma. Looking more globally at numbers from the United Network of Organ Sharing, liver transplants in patients less than one year of age for the indication of hepatic hemangioma between 1989 and 2008, there were 35 transplants. Since 2009 through 2017, zero. Really remarkable. And although this paper was out of Madrid, they did include some uh, US-based uh, data that would indicate that there's also an economic benefit to treating with propranolol versus uh, surgery. So we know that uh, propranolol is saving lives, livers, surgical resources, and money. But what about here at PCH? So this is by no means a formal study. It's just what I did to try and get a ballpark picture of what's happening here locally. So I looked at same-day surgeries between 2009 and 2018 that listed a hemangioma code as the primary diagnosis. And here's what I found. So in 2009, there were 51 cases, and this dropped down to 2000, sorry, to 17 in 2018. Um, now, this is simply observational. I can't for sure say that there's causality between the introduction of propranolol here in 2009, but it's still interesting to look at. Um, now, in general, you see this really nice gradual dip year to year. In 2011, there seems to be a bit of an anomaly, like this steep decline. So I dig so, did some more digging to figure out what might have occurred there, and I think I found the answer. It was my first full year as an attending here. <laughs> so I think I must just have been plucking kids like off the street with hemangiomas or something, I don't know. No, but I, I really don't know why that happened in 2011. <laughs> so I think that together we have solved this mystery of where the OR cases went, and that's that propranolol law has really run off with them. So now that our time together is drawing to a close, I'd invite you to look at this question, read through the answers, and then I'll see what y'all think. Need a little more time? Would you guys read through? All right. Can I have a show of hands for A? Can I encourage more of you to raise your hand for A? <laughs> so, yes, the answer is A. <laughs> so, let's review infantile hemangiomas are GLUT1 positive tumors. Right? Um, and propranolol is first line therapy. Propranolol is not used for vascular malformations. It is not helpful in the treatment of congenital hemangiomas. And there's limited data on its use in KHEs and tufted angiomas. So let's go back to that study that we referred to earlier out of Boston Children's, the one where they found that 25% of those referrals. Um, of kids being treated with propranolol had actually been misdiagnosed with hemangiomas. So they also found that 38% of those referrals were intentionally treated with propranolol for non-hemangioma reasons, with the majority being actually vascular malformations. So this is a cautionary tale. We do not want to replicate that here at PCH. So I'd like to put in a little plug for our vascular anomalies clinic. So this is a clinic that we have here at PCH that meets once a month, and it's comprised of members of dermatology, general surgery, plastic surgery, ENT, interventional radiology, and hematology oncology. 
And so together we tackle these challenging cases of kids with vascular tumors and malformations. We review their histories together, their imaging together, we examine them together, and then we come up with a comprehensive plan of care. Um, the coordinator for this clinic is out of the Clinic of Dermatology. Her name is Mary Ramirez. Um, kids can't be directly uh, referred into this clinic. We first ask that they meet with one of the representatives of the clinic, and then he or she can, can refer them in if it's deemed appropriate. But we're here for you in case you've got a challenging case and need some help. These are my references, and these are my kiddos. Any questions? Correct, yeah. So it started off as a small pink dot, then it grew in width and in thickness. Pretty classic story. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Nope. Okay, well thanks everybody for coming. Appreciate it.